what I'd like to do here in the first uh, you know, 10 or 12 minutes, hopefully, is uh, talk a little bit about the background of feed efficiency. A lot of you have been hearing about it for you know, the better part of a decade now, so I don't want to go into all the gory details, but I do want to give uh, sort of set the table for Paul and Kristen and talk about uh, what we're doing, why we're doing it, uh, why it's important, and then uh, we'll get into some of the details here in the next two presentations. You see our new combined department and our fancy logo there. Uh, so I'll talk about uh, the research. I'll talk a little bit about trait definition, and then I'll hand the baton to Dr. Van Raden. So as most everyone on the call knows, feed is generally the largest single expense on a dairy farm, but even small impacts or improvements in efficiency are really impactful. And one of the nice things is that when we improve feed efficiency, uh, we get multiple benefits, right? So efficient cows tend to be healthy cows, efficient cows tend to be profitable cows. Uh, those efficient animals also have a lower environmental impact in terms of manure production and, and greenhouse gas emissions. And we'll hear a little bit about that, I think, in the second hour. And they also require less land, right, for growing crops and, and in turn less land needed for spreading manure. So it's kind of a win-win if we can improve efficiency. Now, we have improved efficiency over the past century, really, by milk recording and selecting most uh, productive animals. And we want to continue to do that. But if we want to go to the next step of improving efficiency of feed utilization on an individual animal basis, we need to measure daily intakes. And that's really difficult. And that's kind of the, uh, the crux of the problem that we're facing and, and trying to tackle here. It's difficult, it's expensive, it's really not feasible on a, on a very large scale. And, and folks like Rule Veerkamp in, in, in Europe and others did very good work 20, 25, 30 years ago on feed efficiency and really couldn't move ahead without genomics because it was just not practical or even possible to measure individual animal feed intakes on, on many, many thousands or tens or hundreds of thousands of cows every generation in a progeny test program. So we got a grant and by we, it's the Royal We, uh, this project, both projects here were led by Mike Vandahar at Michigan State an esteemed dairy nutritionist there. The first one, Lou Armentano and our faculty here in Wisconsin had a big role too. And that was a $5 million grant to start building a reference population for uh, genomic selection to improve feed efficiency. And then also had some herd management components and uh, especially in uh, related to nutritional grouping. And so that went from about 2011 until um, I think 2017-ish with a one year uh, extension. Subsequently, CDCB and uh, the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research partnered together and funded a project that we're in currently to measure additional animals. So about 720 uh, you know, additional animals per year across uh, several universities. Michigan State with Mike Vandahar and Rob Templeman uh, taking a, a leadership role. Uh, myself, Heather White and Francisco Peña Garcano here at Wisconsin, um, James Coltis at Iowa State and his colleagues, and Jose Santos at Florida, along with our colleagues at USDA and CDCB, and trying to uh, improve or grow the reference population and also look at various proxies and biomarkers and, and ways that we can um, measure or predict feed efficiency. And I'll talk about some of that later. Uh, really what we're talking about here in this slide from Mike Vandar, who taught me about nutrition, at the beginning of this project is how do we get from gross energy consumed to what's captured in milk and body tissue and that's what we're trying to maximize and what we're trying to minimize is the energy that's lost along the way some of that's lost as feces uh, gases urine uh, heat for for uh, digesting and, and breaking down feed and some of it's lost uh, later on for maintenance costs and we'll talk about that and how that relates to body size a composite and Paul will share some data. Um, but what we're trying to do is maximize what gets uh, from the mouth of the cow to uh, either the milk or body, body tissue gain. If we look at this another way, and this is uh, on the vertical axis, we have the milk uh, energy and the body tissue gain energy divided by the total consumed. And on the y or the, the horizontal axis, the x-axis, we have multiples of maintenance. So how much more uh, is the cow eating for milk production relative to what she's eating to maintain her body size? 
and uh, so 2x, 3x, 4x maintenance. And we see that as cows eat more, milk more, they become more efficient, but at a decreasing rate, there's a diminishing return there. And so we want those animals that have high milk yield, low maintenance costs, and then capture as much as possible in that uh, uh, last bucket that I showed on the previous slide of milk and, and particularly milk and dairy cattle. If we were talking about other species, it would be body tissue gain, right? What we chose in the beginning of this project and have stuck to is a 42 day recording period. We looked at some uh, you know, varying lengths in the initial project. We've kind of settled on six weeks minimum in mid lactation. That's usually requires a few days of training or adaptation before that. And um, mid lactation be, being 50 to 200 days in milk because that's when the cow is kind of stable in terms of body weight. Uh, body weight and body weight change are kind of your enemy in trying to predict the efficiency of feed utilization uh, because it's, it's uh, surprisingly hard to measure those really precisely. And so we want uh, the cow not at the beginning of lactation where she's losing a lot of body tissue or at the end where pregnancy plays a big role. And uh, so we focus on that mid uh, 50 to 200 days postpartum. And we measure the, the various things shown there, dry matter intake being the feature, but also body weights and condition scores. And then of course, um, the, the milk and feed uh, analyses. Lots of time spent uh, checking for errors and missing values. Uh, there are, it's no data are perfectly clean, but we have challenges no matter what system, whether uh, you're using manual Wavex or, or an electronic system like GrowSafe or Instant Tech or, or a Kalen Gate system for that matter. We compare residual feed intake or we compute it within research station and within experiment and within contemporary group. And that's kind of what forms a cohort in our studies. Sometimes everybody gets the same feed. Sometimes we have different diets. And if there are different diets, we separate those into different contemporary groups. And, but we have cows from, as I said, Wisconsin, Florida in here. So we have to account for those differences that uh, in heat stress or cold stress. And then data now pass routinely to CDCB for use in genomic evaluations that you'll be hearing about shortly. Uh, residual feed intake is what the cow eats, um, modeled as a contemporary group plus the energy sinks. So when we talk about energy sinks, the big one is milk energy. How much does she secrete in, in the form of milk? Uh, another big one that uh, we'll hear a little bit more about later is maintenance, uh, which is body weight, or metabolic body weight, so body weight to the three quarters power. And then also the change in body weight, which is not great in this uh, six week period, but it's something we have to think about. And so we can show here, for example, in a graph, what we expect the cow to eat and then what she actually eats. And so negative RFI would be a good thing. Uh, that said, we still want high production. We don't want a cow that's milking 25 pounds a day that is doing it efficiently. We want a cow that's milking 150 pounds a day and doing it efficiently if we can get that. And also I'll mention that these energy sinks, um, you know, this model isn't sort of set in stone. It could change over time. If we discovered, for example, that a, a cow needs uh, you know, a certain amount of energy every day for immune function. And we could find a way to measure very accurately that uh, energy being used for immune function. We could add a fourth energy sink or, or a fifth if we discover different things. But right now, what we focus on are those three energy sinks of secreted milk energy, uh, maintenance costs, and then uh, body weight change. In terms of publishing these results, uh, we can look at different options. Um, RFI as a standalone trait is sort of appealing in some ways because it's independent of milk yield or we make it so phenotypically on the last slide in that equation. It's also independent of body size for the same reason and we can make them independent on a genetic basis too. One of the challenges is that the interpretation can be confusing and so we had a, I don't know, five or six, seven years ago, a Discover conference, I remember in Chicago and we, or somewhere in Illinois, uh, and we we had a lot of folks talking about RFI and how small cows would solve this problem. And no, that's not what we're talking about. It was really confusing, especially to non-geneticists when we started talking about um, RFI. And also the reliabilities are, are low, um, period. They're, they're, they're much lower than we're used to. Uh, we could select against dry matter intake as a standalone trait. It's fairly simple. How much did the cow eat? Or at least how much did she eat on a dry matter basis? Reliabilities would be higher, but the disadvantage there is there's a very strong positive correlation with milk yield and, of course, correlations with body size and things, too. And it's really not attractive in that sense because we're kind of remeasuring something we already have. We don't need to measure um, how much she eats to milk when we already measure how much milk she gives. 
uh, feed saved uh, is something that Jenny Price, a uh, uh, outstanding uh, Australian geneticist, came up with about five, six years ago, something like that, as a concept. And the interpretation is relatively simple. So how much did the cow uh, waste, if you will, to being bio due to being biologically inefficient, not getting from that gross feed intake to the um, secreted milk energy effectively and efficiently? And how much did she lose due to or waste due to ex excess body size? And if you combine those two pieces together, and Paul will explain the math of that in a moment, the reliabilities tend to be higher than for RFI. There's some educational effort in this one, uh, but I think less so than for RFI. And I think the concept is, is relatively simple. Okay, the cow is about the right size and she doesn't eat more than she needs. Okay, and we can also extend this to the dry periods and the rearing periods. Uh, we can incorporate how salvage value is impacted when we're talking about feed save. We have to make some assumptions, but they're fairly uh, straightforward assumptions. So when uh, Jenny and her colleagues introduced this in Australia, um, just a review of some of the things they found, they found quite a bit of genetic variation in it on an Australian basis, about uh, 66 kilos a year in uh, genetic standard deviation. So about 1%, you'd say, well, 1% is not a big deal, but 1% every year on every uh, cow, if you could change that, that's, that's a, a lot of feed, right? And they found a, a range here in Australian breeding values of about, uh, 500 kilos uh, per lactation or per year between the best and the worst bulls. Probably with a scaling effect, we'd see something larger. The reliability is around 37%, so not great, but better than for RFI. And the genetic trend uh, there was unfavorable, and Paul will show you some of the trends here in the United States. So what's the roadmap get, look like going forward? Um, so the short-term plan and why we're here today, or one of the main reasons is to talk about publishing feed saved PTAs and putting them into the net merit index, um, we need to continue building that reference population. It's, uh, it's not easy. We, we can do about 320 cows a year here at our facilities. Uh, our collaborators can do another 400 and, and that helps, uh, but it takes a long time, right? It's, it's not cheap. Uh, we have some other options uh, that Joao and, and colleagues can work on uh, partnering with international folks, Canada, uh, other uh, countries, Europe, Australia, per perhaps in getting additional data. And then um, we want to also work as part of this project on developing some proxies or ways to predict dry matter intake on commercial farms using sensors, uh, 3D cameras, artificial intelligence algorithms, and, and so on. And there's a lot of work being done in that area to try and figure out how we could extend this to commercial farms and maintain some accuracy. Uh, we need to do more to understand uh, feed efficiency and understand the physiology of it, the immunology and the rumen microbiology of it. The, um, the rumen microbes play a huge impact here. We don't understand that very well yet. Um, and I think along the way, we're gonna identify some additional energy sinks. And, and so this is a tremendous research opportunity as well as an opportunity for practical impact through uh, genomic selection. And then I th we wanna also look at what uh, interactions we might find with diet. There's been a little bit of work there, but there's plenty more to learn on how what I feed the cow affects uh, her uh, feed efficiency. And does that happen uniformly across families or does it only affect some families and not others? 